So good morning, Christina. Welcome back for our second office hours of the Power and Politics course. And I know you have a number of questions that have come up from the teaching fellows. So why don't we get right to it? Yeah, we actually received a lot of questions this time. And the first one is conceptual, um, in particular on the principal agent problem. So if you could explain it again and how you related it to the, to the point that you were making on privatizing military and prison. So the, the idea behind the principal agent problem is that when you delegate somebody to act on your behalf, they're your agent. But because they're acting on your behalf in the real world, they rapidly gather a lot of the kinds of information uh, that's necessary to pursue your interests. That's why you're having them do it. Mm -hmm. But then they also have the advantage, if they are not inclined to carry out your interests, of having more information than you do, and particularly the information that you need to monitor them. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a divergence of interest between the principal and the agent, the agent is well positioned to take advantage of that and um, pursue their own agenda rather than the interests of the principal. And this is a long-standing um, um, dilemma that e economists and game theorists and others mm -hmm. have studied for decades. And basically um, various ways of dealing with that. Um, one is to introduce competition mm -hmm. among possible agents. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I mentioned earlier in the course the idea of His Majesty's loyal opposition mm -hmm. was that His Majesty wanted to have uh, somebody to keep tabs on His Majesty's ministers who could replace His Majesty's ministers. And so His mm -hmm. Majesty then gets the benefit of the information generated by the opposition um, and so feeds information up the, the, or the chain of command, if, uh, if you like. That's, that's one way of doing it. A second way is to find, to try and align the interests of the principal and the agent better. So if they, if they both, if they both are looking for the same thing, then the problem sort of dissolves. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third is monitoring. Um, but the problem with monitoring is that it's difficult. And mm -hmm. so what um, what I said in the lecture on privatization of prisons and the military is that none of the three standard paths work very well. First of all, you've got, you've got multiple principal agent challenges because it's from the voter to the politician and from the politician to the regulator and from the regulator to the privatized entity. And there are often multiple chains within those, as we saw particularly in the military. So there are many nested principal agent mm -hmm. challenges. Um, and then there's not much competition in either of these industries, um, in fact, as it turns out. Um, the the uh, costs of generating the inf information to monitor them mm -hmm. are very high because there's so many nested principal agent problems. And realigning the interests is, is virtually impossible mm -hmm. because the interest of the voters to not have unnecessary wars and not lock people up mm -hmm. unnecessarily and that really runs diametrically into the interests of the privatized military or the prison mm -hmm. operators. And so um, that's why the principal agent problems are so difficult in those mm -hmm. contexts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so the next couple of questions are on the rise of the right and the crisis of the left in, in the West that we discussed. And the first one is that there's sort of a consensus among political scientists that PR systems, multi-party systems, are relatively more democratic to two-party systems. And can you talk a little bit about that rise of, of that consensus among political scientists? So there's no perfect democratic arrangement. Mm -hmm. We're in a world of what we call the second best, and that mm -hmm. means there are trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And PR is more representative at the electoral stage because the Greens get their people in Parliament and the, the far left Marxists get their people in parliament and the anti-immigration right-wing parties get their people in parliament. Everybody has a seat at the table. In that sense, it's more representative. Mm 
but it's less representative if you think about the accountability of governments for what mm -hmm. they actually implement because um, at the time people are voting they have no idea what government is going to actually be formed and when it comes around to the next election um, the fact that compromises had to be made in putting together a coalition mean that politicians can finger point at one another and say well I know we didn't carry out our mandate that we ran on, but we couldn't because of the, the deal we had to make in the elections. And I used the example most recently of the German national elections where um, the, the SPD membership had been very angry about how much had been conceded in previous coalitions with the CDU, and so they, they chose not to go back into a coalition but then Merkel tried and failed for six months to create a different coalition, uh, which would have produced a very different kind of government if she'd been able to put it together. And um, eventually, out of fear that another election would make the, the far-right alternative for Deutschland do even better, they went back into a, into a grand coalition with the Social Democrats. But of course, Merkel gave up a lot. She gave up the Ministry of Finance, for example, and five other ministries. And so when the CDU is running, running next time around and her members, well, it won't be her, it'll be her mm -hmm. successors' members are angry, um, it'll be blamed on the, on the costs of having to have put together that coalition. Mm -hmm. And so the, you, you, you either get more accountability at the electoral stage or more, more accountability at the governing stage and you have to decide which is more important. Right. Mm -hmm. So you touched on this a little bit, this idea of the segmented democracy and one question we received is what is a segmented democracy and how exactly does it lead to polarization and why is polarization necessarily bad for democracies? So um, the, the phrase segmented democracy is a a uh, term coined by Douglas Ray in a, in a very good pe 1999 paper called Tyrannies of Place. Mm -hmm. um, and what he argued there um, was basically that we, we, are, we are living in, I think he, I'm not sure if he used the example of New Haven, but mm -hmm. um, it is the case in New Haven, for example, that many people who spend four years at Yale uh, mm -hmm. never go to many parts of the city of New Haven, um, which have a very different socioeconomic makeup mm -hmm. than, um, than the, the paths are right. in which they travel. Mm -hmm. So we live in increasingly isolated um, commun sub-communities, if you like, where we tend to hang around people like ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the, the argument that um, Ray made in the 19... In 19 99, and I think he pointed out there that um, the sense that we're all in the, in the same boat mm -hmm. um, gets undermined by that and that mm -hmm. creates um, things called empathy gaps that I'm going to mm -hmm. be talking more about later in the course where people stop seeing the world from the point of view of one another and mm -hmm. thinking about one another's problems. So since Doug Ray wrote that paper, I'd mention two things that in the, in the last couple of decades. One is we've seen more of that kind of segmentation because we've seen more and more red state, blue state sorting, and also more urbanization, which means mm -hmm. blue cities in red states. So people are more and more living in um, communities that are like themselves. And we'll mm -hmm. see uh, when we look at things like housing reform, mm -hmm. uh, similar things happening uh, there. And so that's just accentuated the problem that he was talking about. And then second is the developments in uh, psychological theory that I mentioned in the course, particularly mm -hmm. Kahneman and Tversky, um, who talked about framing effects, but then subsequent research by Kahneman and Cass Sunstein, who's now mm -hmm. at Harvard, um, which tends to show that if you spend time with people like yourself, you or you speak just to people like yourself, people tend to become more extreme. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
the net effect of that, it, it could be people, if you, all you ever see is people who physically bump into on the way to the store. Mm -hmm. uh, if we go to the store anymore, we do all shopping online now. Mm -hmm. um, but it can also be, and we'll be talking more about this as well, it can be segmented media markets where, you know, 30 years ago, um, everybody watched the same evening news, NBC, CBS, or mm -hmm. ABC at 6.30 in the evening. And it was the same newscasters, um, and um, people were part of one conversation. Mm -hmm. When then with the advent of cable TV, we moved into a realm where, um, you know, people on the right get their news from Fox News mm -hmm. and on the left from MSNBC and so forth. And now going to um, Facebook and social exactly. media, this takes yeah. us even further. Yep. So um, that the suggestion is that that this kind of segmentation um, which is growing more extreme and taking on uh, other dimensions is uh, a contributor to the the polarization mm -hmm. where we see um, I think 25 or 30 years ago mm -hmm. about three or four percent of Democrats or Republicans mm -hmm. thought they would be unhappy if their son or daughter married someone from the other party mm -hmm. and now that's gone up by orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. That's pretty concerning. Um, how is that related or how is that bad for our democratic politics? So um, this brings up another set of categories we've talked about exit voice and loyalty mm -hmm. Albert Hirschman um, if people can exit, they have no reason to participate in um, voice in, in coming up with policies that are good for the polity as a whole. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to find is um, you're going to get uh, people privatizing many provisions if they can afford it. Mm -hmm. And those who can't will just have to scramble mm -hmm. uh, and deal with what's left. And yeah. we'll see this repeating itself when we talk about things like education. Um, we've already seen it with uh, privatization of local government services and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and in many other areas. If you, if you have differential capacities for exit, if the costs of exit are much higher for some people than for others, mm -hmm. that creates uh, very bad incentives for policy because right. Those who can bail out will bail out, and those who mm -hmm. cannot won't be able to provide the collective goods for themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this idea of segmentation mm -hmm. also makes us think about the importance of relative versus absolute gains. And we talked in class that economists often stress the importance of absolute gains, but thinking about relative gains can be powerful mm -hmm. and can be used in politics. Um, is that still the case? It, to the same extent today, where we see a crisis on the left that have always had programs around inequality and redistributive wealth, mm -hmm. etc. And when we see like Thatcher or even Trump um, running campaigns that are much more based on absolute gains, where are we in this debate now? What is more important to, to the voters? So the, the findings in the social psychology literature are that, uh, are, that are not widely understood, but I think accurate are twofold. One is that relative differences matter to people, but they, mm -hmm. they tend to be relatively local differences. Yeah. So <clears throat> running on uh, tax the rich, a, a populist campaign to run on tax the rich is not likely to be very effective politically mm -hmm. because um, people don't compare themselves to the very rich. Activists do, but mm -hmm. most voters mm -hmm. do not. Mm -hmm. They tend to compare themselves to similarly situated people. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be the source of, of um, gratifying comparisons. If the people that are similar to you are rewarded in ways that are similar to yours, mm -hmm. but it, and it can also be the the source of invidious comparisons. If you think people who are basically like you are getting ahead in some way that you are not, or getting some form of recognition that you are not. And that was the capuchin monkeys illustration. Mm -hmm. um, so relative differences do matter, um, but they tend to be relatively local comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, then the, 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 other, the other thing is that 
when we think about what exercises people politically, and this applies to both relative and absolute, mm -hmm. um, losing things, um, doing worse than you were before or worse than you reasonably thought you were going to be doing or mm -hmm. having your children do worse than you did, those are going to be more potent politically. This is Kahneman's concept of loss aversion. Mm -hmm. They're going to be more potent politically than um, for going again. And mm -hmm. so the politics of saying make America great again mm -hmm. is a politics of saying something was taken away from you and I'm going to get it back. And that's uh, one of the reasons that was a, a very effective slogan for Trump. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so we studied a lot how the decline in unions had led to a splintering of parties in, in general. Um, and it was very hurtful for, for the left, and that's why we see a crisis there. Why has the right sort of benefited from that splintering, at least in PR, uh, PR systems? Well, the, the reason is, in a nutshell, that social democratic parties that were the mainstay of the social democracy in the mm -hmm. first four decades after World War II were closely connected with industrial workers and trade unions. And as industrial jobs have disappeared and unions have become weaker, those social democratic parties have been defending their members, but they're defending a shrinking uh, a shrinking labor aristocracy less effectively. Mm -hmm. It's shrinking because those jobs are going away and you get more and more workers right. who are not represented by, they're not industrial workers and they're not represented by the unions, so they don't feel they're being protected at all, like mm -hmm. the long-term unemployed or people in service sectors that are not unionized, so that they are available for mm -hmm. um, mobilization by other parties. They may go to the Greens, they may go to the far in Germany to, you know, Der Linke, the far left mm -hmm. group, or they may, they may, as we, we actually saw on one of the slides in the lecture, they may get mobilized by the far right as anti-immigrant, um, if they think their jobs are being taken by immigrants, which it's easy to convince people of, whether mm -hmm. it's true or not, being beside the point, mm -hmm. usually not true. <laughs> Um, so that, um, that's one reason that people, there are fewer and fewer people, whereas in, you know, in days of yore, um, when virtually the whole economy was unionized in a country like Germany and they had, they had in place agreements that the, that the bargaining arrangements made in the unionized parts of the, of industries would be replicated even in the ununionized parts, you didn't have that divergence of interest and you didn't have these people available for mobilization. Mm -hmm. Then the second problem is that, that these left of center parties are weaker. Um, they've all had to make huge concessions uh, in order to get power at all. And this is true mm -hmm. in two-party systems. We saw we talked about New Labor and the New Democrat, but it's also true in multi-party systems. So you see the SPD implemented the Hartz reforms in the first five years of the century in Germany, which were very pro-business, creating more labor market flexibility, um, all the things that business tends to want um, as conditions for retaining power. Mm -hmm. Though actually they, they lost power anyway mm -hmm. in 2005, mm -hmm. despite having in, in implemented all of the hard four reforms. Mm -hmm. So the, it's, it's basically the story is a, is a less powerful left of center parties defending fewer workers and that right. makes them available for mobilization by right. others. Mm -hmm. I mean you just brought it up. Um, it seems like the left cannot respond any more effectively to the needs of workers that have been laid off and kind of are in this post-industrial society now where new needs have emerged. And is it an unwillingness or it, it, are, is there a structural reason as to why these center-left parties are unable to cater to these needs anymore? Where do you see does this crisis emerge? What, what is driving it? Well, I don't think they're unable to, but mm -hmm. they have not done. Mm -hmm. And I think it's partly um, not understanding the real dynamics of what are going mm -hmm. on. It's partly uh, living in the past. It's partly uh, not seeing... As, and this will be a, a big theme of the last part of the course. It's 
it's not seeing that insecurity, um, long-term employment insecurity mm -hmm. is a much more serious problem for most workers than um, inequality, for example. Right. And I think the, 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 the focus of activists on inequality doesn't really serve the political left well in multi-party systems mm -hmm. or in, in, in two-party systems. That mm -hmm. uh, while some reduction in inequality is going to be important for reasons having to do with empathy gulfs and other things I'm mm -hmm. going to talk about, the most important uh, medium-term strategy for parties that are going to do well in the future are going to be strategies that address employment insecurity, the fact that, you know, somewhere between most 18-year-olds most today in mm -hmm. industrialized countries are going to be facing changing their jobs maybe 12 to 15 times mm -hmm. in, their, in their employment lifetimes. Mm -hmm. That is a new, completely new world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, much of it has to do with technology and the uh, mobility of capital but attacking immigrants or complaining about inequality will not address it. You really yeah. have to see what's driving. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody talks about there's more polarization, there are more angry voters, but they right. don't say enough about why, what's actually yeah. driving yeah. it. And the big theme is insecurity. And so it's strategies for confronting insecurity that are going to be where the rubber meets the road going yeah. forward. Interesting. So it's less of a structural problem and more a problem of lack of innovation and trying to understand how to cater to these new needs? Well, it's a di it is I think mm -hmm. it's a structural problem, but it's a, it's a different structural problem than a lot of people are focusing on. The, mm -hmm. the basic structural problem is the, the changed nature of labor markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not a cyclical problem. It's a yeah. structural mm -hmm. problem. And so even though, you know, in the U.S. now we have less than 4% unemployment, that's not a relevant statistic politically because you have a lot of people employed who uh, might be working at McDonald's who 15 years ago were working on an assembly line as a middle level uh, or maybe even lower level manager. Mm -hmm. So they, they might be employed, but they're downwardly mobile. They're making less money. They may well be only being able to put bread on the table by having two rather than one wage earner in the family. Mm -hmm. They may have children in their 30s who um, are not employable or yeah. certainly not employed. So they don't show up as unemployed, but they are deeply disaffected people with very good reason. And mm -hmm. unless, unless politicians can come up with policies to address the needs of those people, um, that we're going to get more of the sort of politics we've been seeing since 2016. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, we also received a lot of questions on privatization. Mm -hmm. And I know you had this little poll with the audience where you asked um, the terms neoliberalism and Washington consensus, kind of which one is, is more negative, um, kind of has a more negative uh, connotation. And could you clarify again why neoliberalism is kind of a, a more negative term than than the Washington consensus here in the United States? Well, I would, I would say I thought it was very revealing when I did the poll in the class mm -hmm. that more people thought neoliberalism is a pejorative term than the Washington consensus. Oh, I asked this okay. question wrong, so should I say it again? Pardon? I, think I, I, I asked the question incorrectly, so should I say it again? It I think when, when I ran the poll in the class, yeah, people said most, neoliberalism there, was more. M pe people perceived neoliberalism to be a pejorative term, yeah, yeah, but not, yeah, not so yeah. much the Washington Consensus. Yeah. However, if, as you know, because you're an expert on mm -hmm. uh, the Global South, yeah. go <laughs> around the Global different. South, go around <laughs> Africa, go mm -hmm. to India and ask about the Washington Consensus, and you get a very different answer. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think the, the, the takeaway there is simply that the idea that we should be tightly disciplined right. isn't so appealing <laughs> as the idea that other people should be tightly mm -hmm. disciplined. I yeah. don't think it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. Another question we received is, what are some of the analytical frameworks that are useful in helping us to think about the impact of privatization on the role of the state? I think the exit voice and loyalty is the heart of the matter there, because um, if you think about privatization, you know, we, when we come back to the 
the issue of housing. Um, so, you know, people used to think gated communities were things for rich people, mm -hmm. right? Rich people would shut themselves off. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that's no longer true. We've got, mm -hmm. you know, these community interest developments. We've, in the U.S., this, in, 10 years ago, which was the most recent data I could find, there were over 60 million people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 20% of the U.S. population. It's probably 70 million people today living in these, in these communities. And so we've, it, this connects back to the segmented democracy. You go to, a, you know, go, go to Miami or Fort Lauderdale, for example, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you'll just see moving a quarter of a mile back from the water a different price Mm -hmm. uh, for these, <laughs> from multi-million mm -hmm. to, you know, $80,000 mm -hmm. if you get far enough away. And so you've got, you've got gated communities that um, correspond to different income levels. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, those who can't afford any. But uh, the problem is going to be if, if some people can bail out and provide their own policing and their own utilities and their own street mm -hmm. lights and their own garbage pickup and their own swimming pools, then you're going to get the under provision of public goods for the rest. And that's going to be the problem. Mm -hmm. And we see this, um, we see this with education. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, ha we'll spend a whole class on education, but mm -hmm. essentially the fact that you have that, that you have a system in which people can either bail out physically mm -hmm. into, uh, suburban towns or can bail out fiscally by sending their kids to private schools mean that all of those people have incentives to under provide um, mm -hmm. good schools for the rest of the country. Right. We mm -hmm. see it in healthcare. Once, mm -hmm. once you no longer have um, the individual mandate, which was part of the Obamacare law that was repealed in, as part of Trump's 2017 tax reform, mm -hmm. the individual mandate was repealed. The problem then is you get what economists call adverse selection in insurance markets because the only people who, who voluntarily want to buy insurance then are sick people. Mm -hmm. But that creates um, very expensive pools to insure. The whole idea of insurance pools is that everybody's in them and so um, you, you, you drive down the price that way and so insurance markets will just unravel just as, you know, if, if, you, if you said um, we, we don't have to have auto insurance, mm -hmm. um, you know, the most dangerous people wouldn't, wouldn't insure, <laughs> um, the people who, who had no assets anyway. And so, right. um, mm -hmm. so there's certain kinds of markets where, where unless everybody participates, you, mm -hmm. you get this problem of adverse selection and the markets unravel. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so that's the, that's the problem when you have very different capacities for exit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Just one more example in Oregon, I think it was, the, they were trying to decide which procedures would be covered in Medicaid, mm -hmm. which is insurance for yeah. poor people. Um, and they, they held um, deliberative uh, c uh, dis, you know, town hall meetings about that mm -hmm. to vote and to debate and to vote on which, which procedures would be covered. But then it turned out that the, the great majority of the people there were not on Medicaid. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, mm. for them, it's, it's, it's an academic question or worse that, you know, they, they don't want to provide pay more, in time, you know, Medicaid, partly federal block grants, but it's also uh, low, it's re taxes low, raised at the state level. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't have any interest in paying more taxes to cover more Medicaid procedures that they're not using, mm -hmm. right? So this is the problem if you have yeah. different capacities for exit, but not for decision making. Mm -hmm. And that's the real, so mm -hmm. I think it's a Hirschman story. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so this term privatization as a category seems to be covering a lot and mm -hmm. it's often justified in terms of how we precisely define <coughs> public goods. And we talked about the definition brought forward by economists. Um, and a student was interesting, uh, interested in how does the rhetoric of public versus private uh, 
use actually function in political discourse and has it shifted over time? Um, and is the term public good deployed differently now than a few decades ago? Well, public goods as it's used in common discourse is much broader than it, public goods as it's used by economists mm -hmm. because the number of things that are really public goods in the economist sense is very small. Okay. Like, you know, you, th you think clean air is mm -hmm. a public good. Even that, yeah. you know, if, if we could all have, if we could all have, you know, um, bubbles and ba right. over our heads yeah, and, yeah. and backpacks with oxygen mm -hmm. tanks, maybe even clean air would stop being a public mm -hmm. good. Because for a, something to be a public good in the economist sense, it must be both um, uh, not you, you supply non-excludable, so giving it to me that can't, uh, if we create it for me, we, could, we build a road for me, we can't stop you driving on it. And non-rivalrous, so if I enjoy sunshine, it doesn't stop you enjoying it. Or if I enjoy the driving on the road, doesn't, uh, that's a very, for instance, most people think, edu it's very narrow, most people yeah. think education is a public good. Education mm -hmm. doesn't fit that definition. It's easy to exclude yeah. people from right. education. Mm -hmm. uh, and think about, uh, you know, five people consuming a teacher's time versus 50 people consuming a teacher's time. It clearly is, is rivalrous because mm -hmm. they're going to get much less well educated if they're 50 than if they're five. So mm -hmm. education in the economist sense is not a public good, but yeah. nine out of 10 people think mm -hmm. education is a public good. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in common understanding, uh, it's m people, what pe people want to call public goods are things that have a lot of negative externalities. Mm -hmm. So if you have a bad education system, bad public education system, even if you are educating your children at private schools, there's going to be a lot of fallout of having a bad ed educational system. You're not going to have a well-educated labor force. You're going to probably have a lot of crime. You're going to have all these other... So you'll, you get a lot of negative externalities, but that's not the same thing as, mm -hmm. as saying that education is a public good. Right. It's mm -hmm. Then the question becomes how to manage the externalities. So mm -hmm. I think that that's the conceptual point. Um, and so the economist definition of a public good is much too narrow, certainly mm -hmm. to cover a lot of what people have been talking about privatizing, mm -hmm. many, many things. Yeah. And I think there, the, th the theory of privatization is just that government's not very good at doing things. Mm -hmm. um, the, as Reagan said, yeah, you know, yeah. government mm -hmm. is the problem. Yeah. And so, um, so you think about uh, other solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, where a lot of the impetus to privatize things like railroads and utilities and so on came from. Mm -hmm. And then you have to trade off the way that externalities are handled when the government's doing it with the ways externalities right. are handled when the private sector is doing it. Mm -hmm. So if you privatize the railways, well, yeah, but there may be communities that are, don't have enough people to make it worthwhile for anybody to run a train there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, again, you're going to get a Hirschman problem start mm -hmm. to the, mm -hmm. the people, the people who can exit will exit to happy conditions and those who are left behind will be worse off. Right. Uh, you just talked about CIDs, and I know in class we also talked about their negative implications. For example, how do you still cater to the needs of the homeless, um, all of that. Um, another negative implication could be also just the impact that the elite secession has on, on, on just what the, the government provides for the population in general, mm -hmm. because the elite has more power to demand public goods from the government, and if the demands of, of the elite are met by private solutions, then we could end up with situations like in the developing world where these public goods are not being provided anymore, or um, they're just decreasing in quality, as we see maybe in the U.S. or in, in Europe. So what, what is your comment on that? So I'm... This is going to be a, a major theme of the last part of the course, so I'll just mm -hmm. speak briefly to it mm -hmm. now, but uh, a big part of the source of our um, politics since 2016 has, is a byproduct of the elite's complacency about exactly that. So in the 30s, 
um, when we had 20% unemployment and a communist system out there competing for the hearts and minds of American mm -hmm. workers, there were many people among business elites who understood the importance of, of uh, not creating a situation where the workers felt they had nothing to lose but their chains, as Marx mm -hmm. and Engels had put it in the Communist Manifesto. Mm -hmm. um, after the collapse of communism, where there's no real alternative out there, the sort of path of least resistance to move to the suburbs and build more prisons or move to gated communities and sort of out of sight, out of mind, uh, it's a very easy path to go. Um, but the cost is all of these vulnerable, underserved populations mm -hmm. who are being left behind by mm -hmm. all the technological innovation um, eventually be turning into dynamite, political mm -hmm. dynamite that can then mm -hmm. be mobilized in ways that the elites are not going to like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the complacency of the elites has fed this idea that they can exit to you, come back to Hirschman, yeah. mm -hmm. has, has fed a, a lack of attention to the sorts of problem that are now exploding in their faces. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So shifting gears a little bit, a student also had a question on the military. Mm -hmm. And um, we discussed how kind of using military contractors um, reduces the costs of war. Mm -hmm. So it might make the U.S. more likely to, to go to war in the first place. At the same time, in the U.S., we also have an all-volunteer force that appears increasingly isolated from the population as a whole. So how do we, is it necessary to make war cheaper on the contractor front if, if we already have this other development that um, kind of, it's an all-volunteer anyways and it, it is more isolated to the, it's becoming more isolated to the general population. So I think the arithmetic there is just wrong. So if mm -hmm. you if you compare if you compare the first Gulf War in 1991, mm -hmm. um, where we where um, even then we had a lot of military contractors, mm -hmm. we used about half a million troops in that war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when we're talking about uh, Afghanistan, we we're talking about you know, very small numbers, you know, much, nowhere, nowhere near that, you know, and we, I think, in, we, we tried to keep our American troops below 10,000 in, in Afghanistan. And um, first of all, if you really wanted to hire half a million military mm -hmm. contractors to occupy a country, mm -hmm. you probably couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, the cost would be, I don't even know there would be half a million, but the cost would be mm -hmm. enormous. Um, so if, you, if you're going to, if you're going to fight a successful war, um, it's still going to be very expensive. Now, it, it is true that the technology of war is changing rapidly. And so in terms of just destroying a country, you we'll be able to do it with drones and mm -hmm. you know but we've had that capacity since yeah. the advent of nuclear weapons um, and the truth is you know having the capacity to s dis destroy a country is does not translate into the capacity to subdue its population and govern mm -hmm. it um, as we've seen with the now you know mm -hmm. 17 year uh, ungovernable Afghanistan mm -hmm. and look just at Iraq mm -hmm. Um, you know, 25 million people in Iraq, and uh, you know, we 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 occupied them. We we and uh, you know, despite Abu Ghraib and all the kind of mm -hmm. um, haphazard use of vicious force that I talked about as a sign of a weak state, mm -hmm. we were not able ever to govern uh, effectively. Or we'll just mm -hmm. look at Syria, um, where we've again been involved since 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and failed miserably in that civil war context. So I, I think that the idea that you can subdue populations without large numbers of troops is mm -hmm. a fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if you're really going to, to try and do that with, with um, either, a, we, you know, if we were trying to, if we were gonna, if you think of the wars we've been fighting in Afghanistan, uh, in, in, uh, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, paying a professional army to fight those would, would be uh, colossally expensive. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it's probably not possible to mm -hmm. turn over the governance of an occupied country to yeah. to a mercenary force. Mm -hmm. So I don't think uh, I, you know that everybody focuses on the technology of war, but mm -hmm. and I'm going to talk more about this in upcoming lectures. That has very little to do with creating a Weberian state that mm -hmm. can monopolize mm -hmm. the coercive use of force in mm -hmm. a given territory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So our last question uh, brings us back to the lecture we had on Thursday on prisons. And I know that you showed two graphs that were very interesting. So there was uh, a decrease in violent crimes over time, but then we see an increase in incarceration rates. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the reasons for the decline in violent crimes, mm -hmm. for example, and more education for women. Um, but can you clarify the puzzle here that despite the decrease in violent crimes, we do see an increase in incarceration, incarceration rates? So, as I said, there are multiple competing explanations for that out there, including mm -hmm. the argument that incarceration is working. Mm -hmm. uh, which I don't, if you look at the data, I don't find it very credible, but mm -hmm. uh, the, I, I suspect it's not. I think, I, you know, based on my reading of the literature, the, the biggest predictor of violent crime in a country is males in the population between mm -hmm. the ages of 18 and 25. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually thought the more interesting puzzle was not that one, but mm -hmm. the, the graph, this, the next graph I put up, mm -hmm. which shows that crime, crime, violent crime has been going down, but people believe that it's been going up. Um, one student came and talked to me about it at the end of the class, was mm -hmm. this a byproduct of 9-11, because mm -hmm. that's when the perception that crime is going up really takes off. Mm -hmm. There might be something to that. But I think the, the, there's been, for much longer term than that, a big disjunction between what, how, how much violent crime pe people believe there is mm -hmm. and how much violent crime there actually is. Mm -hmm. As with, for example, immigration, illegal immigration, right. we're seeing this play out now. Mm -hmm. There's a, ma you know, there's a massive disjunction. Most people think it's going up, but it's actually been going down mm -hmm. for uh, a very long number of years. And I, th I think that the answer here is in that work I mentioned of a political scientist called Stuart Scheingold. Mm -hmm. um, and it's essentially what economists call cheap talk. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to run for office on these issues because yeah. uh, you find a bogey ban, you find somebody to blame, which is, is always easy in politics. And then most of, the, most of the solutions turn out not to be expensive mm -hmm. to, to you politically. Mm -hmm. So federal politicians can run on getting tough on crime, but most convictions and in, incarceration occurs in state prisons. So mm -hmm. it's essentially creating yeah. unfunded mandates mm -hmm. on the states for the most part. Mm -hmm. And if you think, you know, think about immigration, you know, Trump said, and Mexico will pay, and Mexico mm -hmm. will pay, but they're yeah. not paying. Um, and that's partly why he's run into so much uh, opposition now to actually mm -hmm. build his wall Deliver because it. it's going to cost American taxpayers yeah. if they really do it. And representatives, including, you know, even when the Republicans controlled both houses of Congress, he couldn't get them to ante up the money for mm -hmm. his wall. But that's atypical. Most of the most of the running against crime, it, it's it's cheap talk for politicians mm -hmm. to whip up support for something that is not going to be costly to them down the road politically. Right. Great. These were all the questions for this time. We'll see you again <laughs> soon. Thank you.